So I'm scrolling through Twitter the other day and I come across this tweet from Jack Krawcheck saying that BARD, aka Google's version of OpenAI's ChatGPT, can now help with understanding YouTube videos. For example, let's say a video shows how someone makes their special olive oil cake, but you're only curious about one ingredient, which is how many eggs the recipe requires. Okay, ask BARD like you would ask any good baker in your life, get your answer immediately, and then be on your merry way. This update allows for deeper engagement with YouTube videos and has the potential to drastically change how we approach the platform. So I ran to Twitter search bar and typed in Bard in YouTube to see if anyone else was talking about this because again, it's wild. And the conversation was minimal, but I did come across these two examples. This person asked Bard for a specific date mentioned within a set of videos he was curious about and Bard answered right away. And this person asked Bard to create bullet points for the various Python elements discussed in a video Python is a coding language. He then immediately exported those bullet points to Google Docs to get to work. This is a big deal. Not only has YouTube been a catalyst in my education, unfortunately, even more so than my college experience, but recently conversational AI has really clicked for me in a way that fast tracks my daily thought process and the potential when it comes to exploration and education it's substantial. So to see how good it really is, I asked Bart about two videos of mine. First, I asked for an overview of media is changing, dot, 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 big time. And the output was actually pretty spot on. I then had a lengthier conversation about my interview with Taylor Lorenz. The summary was a bit off. When I asked Bart about all the questions I asked Taylor, the ones it gave were correct but it left out about like 60% of them. I asked what some funny moments were from the interview. And at this point it started spelling Taylor's last name wrong, as well as getting who said what a bit wrong, but still it came back with one to two valid moments. And lastly, when I asked Bart about the sentiment in the comment section, as well as for the video's transcript, it just made stuff up instead of saying, I don't know, or I don't do that. So there's work to be done, but again, the potential is definitely there. Though with that, a worry, immediately came to mind. If someone utilizes BARD and eventually ChatGPT, etc., to fast track through the information provided in a YouTube video, that's amazing. But there still needs to be some type of engagement awarded to the video within the YouTube algorithm. Maybe it's the same way as a like, comment, or ideally it varies depending on the amount of information extracted. Regardless, this definitely needs to happen. And as this person reiterated, this needs to happen ASAP. So I reached out to Jack, whose tweet I originally saw, to have a conversation about Bard. He's a senior director of product management at Google, who's responsible for the development, experience, and growth of Bard globally. In today's video, we talk about the trajectory of Bard, whether that be related to YouTube creators or taking the broader Google ecosystem to the next level, because things like Gmail, everything within Drive, Docs, Sheets, Slides, and so many other Google products have become such integral parts of our lives. And in the coming years, they're just likely to be more deeply integrated with Bard. Also want to provide the most up-to-date information. In the interview, I mentioned that BARD is powered by Lambda, similar to how ChatGPT is powered by GPT 3.5 or GPT 4, depending on if you have a subscription or not. But there's an update on that. BARD was originally powered by Lambda when it was announced in February, but in May, that was updated to Palm 2. And as of literally yesterday, December 6, 2023, BARD is now powered by Gemini. I didn't get the scoop during the interview. Super proud and excited to announce the launch of the Gemini era, a first step towards a truly universal AI model. Each of the 50 different subject areas that we tested on, um, it's as good as the best expert humans in those areas. I've started making my omelet. Does it look ready now? It looks like it's almost ready. You can flip it over to cook the other side. Why is it not ready? It's not ready because the eggs are still running. Who wore it better? The zebra. Oh, I like this. The zebra has been wearing its stripes for millions of years. Given the play on words in these images, guess the name of the movie. The Breakfast Club. Tell me what you see. I see you placing a piece of paper on the table. I see a squiggly line. Give me some ideas for what I could make with this. I see pink and green yarn. How about a dragon fruit? Or how about a green cake with a pink heart? With Gemini, you can upload a photo of handwritten answers on a worksheet. Not only can Gemini solve these problems, but this is the amazing part. It can read the answers and understand what was right and what was wrong. Here, Gemini identifies that the formula was correct 
but there was a mistake in calculating height. Scientists need to search among thousands of scientific papers for key information and extract them by hand. It's a very common workflow and very time consuming. Over a lunch break, Gemini read 200,000 papers for us, filtered it down to 250, and extracted their data. I've worked on AI my whole life because I've always felt it would be the most beneficial and consequential technology for humanity. Very rare that you can work on a technology at a foundational level and it simultaneously can impact all our products. But yeah, the model's capabilities surpassed GPT-4 on basically every benchmark. It's all super interesting to think about and let's get into the conversation. Before we get into things, I'm back in another turtleneck because it's just that time of year. It's chilly, we're hanging out, we're gifting, we're giving. And for that reason, I'm excited to be partnering with Back Market on today's video. Whether it be the monitor I have right here or the camera lens I'm currently filming with, Back Market has helped me save money and reduce my contribution to the growing e-waste issue. What it is, is a global marketplace for high quality refurbished tech. So while there are a ton of shiny new toys coming out that are creating genuinely new realms of technology, when it comes to buying the current essentials, consider taking the refurbished route. Like look here, these graphs compare the environmental impact of new versus refurbished smartphones, tablets, laptops, and desktops. You could also consider providing your old devices to their trade-in service. It takes two minutes, aside from sending the device, of course. And by the end of it, your device isn't being wasted. You're providing refurbished and more affordable technology to someone else, and you get compensated for it. Like I said earlier, it's the holiday season. The back market always has good deals by offering up to 70% off year round. You can also receive $15 off your first order of $250 or more if you sign up for emails. I'm thankful to be working with them and would love to hear about your future experience. So check out back market in the description. Now let's get into the conversation. Jack, thank you so much for the time. I've been observing Bard ever since it was announced back in February, and I have so many questions, but especially around last week's updates and rollouts. So I just want to get started. How would you explain what Bard is to a fifth grader and where did the name Bard come from? So imagine you've got a magic library that you go to that doesn't only help you find any book in the world that you would want to learn from, but also helps you write a book. It helps you write the story of whatever idea or curiosity that you have in your mind. And in the same way that when we're taught in school, you have to look in more than one place to write a story, especially if you're going to talk about something that happened. Um, Bard gives you the tools to be able to double check those things and find other sources. And so uh, it's a little bit like a magic library that helps you tell a story, which is actually part of the second question, which is why do we call it Bard? Uh, Bards over time have been storytellers and story is the first programming language. It's the first way that we taught abstract concepts to build complex uh, realities in our world. This notion that words create worlds um, was the spirit behind why we named it Bard and this magic library that you have at your disposal. Okay, that explanation sits well, because to be honest, I was very critical of the name Bard when I first heard it. I just thought it was some weird word. I didn't really know it had a meaning. And then a few weeks or months went by and I came across something that talked about the meaning of the word Bard. And I was like, all right, I can maybe come around to it. But I want to get into some important context for viewers. In a way, Bard is a reaction to ChatGPT. OpenAI's launch of this back in November of 2022, I assume created a lot of pressure and urgency internally to get something out to the world. Simultaneously, Google has been working towards a system with Bard's capabilities for years. At Google I.O. in 2021, you guys revealed Lambda, your conversational large language model, LLM, that actually powers Bard. So how are you looking at the competition between Bard and ChatGPT today? Yeah, I mean, Google's been at solving one large problem for 25 years, which is organizing the world's information and making it universally uh, helpful and accessible. And this is just another step in that direction. When we look at where we are today versus where we were a year ago, yeah, a lot has changed. And like, I, I do want to give credit and admiration for a lot of the creativity that ChatGPT helped spark in people's lives. But the reality is 
the vast majority of people in the world still haven't used this technology. And we've been studying it for years. And so when we bring BARD to people in the world, what we're focused on is answering the question of what does it take to get you to get an idea that's in your mind and bring it to life? And we've seen people doing that. I mean, BARD's been out now. Uh, I think we're, we're about to cross uh, our eight month mark. Uh, so it hasn't even been a year. And we've seen people coming from all around the world and over 200 countries and territories around the world that are using it as a way to bring an idea to life. Like one of my favorite things was uh, there was a local business entrepreneur in uh, the middle of the US that was sharing their story with us, which is they were trying to open a store in their town and they'd never applied for a business loan before. And they started taking screenshots of their pitch that they're gonna take to their local bank. And they said, what are some ways that I can increase my probability of getting a loan? And I like a year ago, there was no technology in the world that could do that. Like you just had to like maybe call up a friend that had an uncle that had a, another friend at a bank that might give you a tip. And now it's bringing this access to people. And so when I think about where we were a year ago today, where we are right now and where we're going to be moving forward, the thing that's driving us and to your question, how's Google thinking about it? We're obsessing over like what happens when you have this magic at your fingertips. The ability not just to get answers, but to generate possibilities that trigger your creativity and your ideas to come to life. It's uh, the competition is really people's imagination coming to life. And that's what I get personally most excited about when it comes to Bard. I mean, it's all been fascinating to observe. And this tweet from Jason Calacanis last week embodied what I think is a massive deal moving forward. He said, Google Bard is still clunky with a horrible UI. But if Sundar Pichai can keep pushing the heads of verticals like YouTube to have deep integration in BARD, it's going to have a huge advantage over competitors. And if Google blocks other language models from having access to YouTube, it's game on. It's like, yeah, YouTube is this powerhouse, and of course, gatekeeping it would cause this insane advantage. It reminds me of a relationship that's been in the press a lot lately, which is iMessage versus SMS versus RCS. And for viewers' context, RCS is basically the improved version of SMS. It allows for features like red receipts, typing indicators, and so on, which would make the relationship between iMessage, iPhones, and Androids much more cohesive and enjoyable. But Apple has refused to update SMS to RCS. So basically it's helped create, aside from the blue bubbles, it's helped create that social ostracization over the past few years, which has really worked in the US amongst the younger generations. So yeah, again, when I think about the relationship of being able to gatekeep YouTube's data, specifically to BARD, and in a few years when BARD and you know other LLM capabilities are maybe on the same playing field, and then BARD has YouTube on top of that, that's an insane advantage. First of all, is it even possible to gatekeep YouTube transcripts? And if so, how are you currently thinking about a decision like this from a competition perspective versus a humanity access to information perspective? I, I think it's tempting to try to prognosticate where we're going to be in, in five years time. And the reality is no one knows exactly where we're going to be in a year's time. If you told me a year ago that we'd be where we are today with these models being able to bring ideas to life in the way that they are, I, I would have thought it would take three years. To your question specifically around YouTube and, and frankly, other products that we um, have worked on bringing into uh, BARD in the form of extensions, the best answer I can give is we're approaching this as a step-by-step -step experiment to understand how can this be most helpful for people. And everything we do at Google is rooted in three respects that we talk about. Respect the user, respect the opportunity, and respect each other. And when it comes to respecting the user, that's the experimentation piece. How can we make this technology the most helpful for you as we're exploring its capabilities to do things with you? But on the respect the opportunity part, we have to acknowledge everything we do at Google is only possible because we have a healthy and open ecosystem mm -hmm. of creators, of people that make things. And so when we think about 
solving the problems that could be forthcoming, such as the ones that you mentioned, we take it from an approach of, hey, well, first, let's understand how people are trying to use the technology, how we can make it most helpful, and how we can make it so that everyone in the ecosystem is able to see the benefits of these things and it doesn't create uh, sort of a, a lopsided or, or one-sided environment. Hmm, okay. Doubling down on the potential of BARD and YouTube's relationship, let's talk about the big updates that were announced last week regarding this initial integration. Users are now able to engage more deeply with YouTube videos, whether that be prompting the extraction of information, creating a summary, and so on. From a technical perspective, how is BARD integrated with YouTube to understand these videos? Is it just processing the transcripts or is it also processing other audio and visual elements within the videos? Yeah, so BARD has the ability right now uh, to take image inputs and text inputs. Uh, we, don't do, we don't do video inputs, though that's an exciting field of research that's taking place right now. Um, so really, uh, as you're looking to understand the interaction with YouTube videos in BARD, we're trying to understand moments in the video where um, something may have happened uh, that you want to gain deeper insight into. Let's say you're watching a lecture um, from an MIT series and you wanted to get into that specific example where they talked about uh, macroeconomics and like the price of apples. We can help find, uh, we can help you find that and also help reason about some of those things, how you might want to create a potential study guide as you go through that. And so we're trying to find uh, more of these ways to make new access into videos more helpful for people. My visceral reaction is that this is amazing for consumers and I think for pretty obvious reasons. But for creators, I think there's more so this elephant in the room. I'm someone who researches a lot for my work. I'm watching a ton of videos. And I remember when YouTube introduced the ability to access transcripts. That was a big deal. When YouTube introduced chapters on videos, that was a big deal because time is money and sitting through a video can be a lot of time. So anything that can help that. But now thinking about this integration of Bard and YouTube, it's like, oh my gosh, I'm going to be utilizing this all the time. But it creates this entirely different form of engagement with videos. And that's a big deal for creators because right now, how does YouTube know to algorithmically push a video more? There are a lot of factors, but watch time is the biggest. So if I'm instead going to a video for a few seconds just to grab the link and then hop over to Bard, again, that's an entirely different form of engagement. Even though arguably it's a more notable form of engagement because I'm literally having a conversation with the content of their video. I'm literally having a conversation with their research, the information they curated like all the time that they put into this video, recording, editing, so on, I'm having a conversation with their finished work. And depending on the questions I'm asking, you know, like if I'm asking for a general overview, maybe that's weighted less than me asking them for an extensive summary. That could be more like, yeah, sitting through the video in full. Um, but yeah, it's a extremely notable form of engagement as you guys pitched it, it's a deep form of engagement. So how are you making sure that this relationship between BARD and YouTube is fair for creators? Yeah, so I think it's a fair question and I spend my time focused on BARD and uh, of course I represent uh, Google. Uh, many colleagues at YouTube are focused on ensuring the way that we measure engage engagement continues to strike that balance between those principles that, we, that I mentioned earlier respect the opportunity, respect the user, respect each other. And so nothing changes in that regard. And there have been many format changes over time that focus on engagement. And so we have a track record of ensuring that as new ways to consume content come in, we're appropriately understanding how that changes and shifts. And as a, an individual, uh, one thing I, I would note of why I care deeply about this is I actually spent a large portion of my career working directly with creators. Mm -hmm. uh, I helped launch a company uh, named United Masters uh, that is a company that's dedicated to 
helping artists maximize their full potential. It's effectively a record label in your pocket and understanding how critical these platforms are to creating forms of art, forms of education, forms of information is so critical. And so when I look at the opportunities that we have with Bard, this becomes potentially a new canvas. Now, I say potentially because, again, we've been out for eight months. There's so many things that we still have to learn. But when I think about a tool that's a creative collaborator, it doesn't only help you consume information in new ways, it helps you create information in new ways. And I'm really excited to see, even just a couple of days in, how people are already tuning to using Bard and YouTube to get deeper understanding on some complex topics and using that to apply uh, apply their information in new ways. Yeah, I have no doubt that your teams at Google and YouTube are going to figure it out and probably in really interesting ways. I mean, Google and YouTube were at the forefront of the creator economy in a lot of ways when it comes to AdSense and paying creators for posting on the platform. You guys have had that for over a decade and still a lot of platforms have not been able to find a way to compensate creators like that. Um, it's just all really interesting. And I think this Bard and YouTube integration, it's just such a useful use case that once it catches wind, I think it's going to be this crazy domino snowball effect. So I just think it's a conversation that might need to be had sooner rather than later. But something that's also interesting is like, could this cause a resurgence of text? Video has been at the forefront of culture the past few years, but I've always thought that like, you know, text is just so useful in terms of, yeah, time, efficiency, being able to sift through information easier. It's like, could that happen? I know LLMs and conversational AI are going to, to your point, integrate more image and video. And that's still like multimedia is the thing. But I think text has kind of taken a back seat a bit the past few years. But it's like, could that happen? That's part of the fun of all this too, yeah. is we have access to new tools that we haven't had before. It's like, you know, when the first wheel was created, people didn't have cars, but we got there over time. And I think we're getting a new tool in our toolkit. It's not here to replace things. That's an easy, that's an easy thing to fall into when you see something new. Oh, this is the X killer. But the thing that we're starting to realize, like I even go back eight months where people are saying, oh, this is the new search for Google. This is the new this, this is the new that. And it's very clear, especially seeing the way that people use Bard, it's not a Bard or search, it's a Bard and search. Like People are doing things that we've never seen search queries do. Like there's software developers that are out there that are using it to debug code. And then you have creative people that are out there in the world of advertising agencies, helping them think through headlines for uh, for commercials that they're creating, like this possibility generation is remarkable. And so when we look at like what's ahead for us, the thing that I think is the most critical for us to continue to anchor on is the opportunity is something that is at the core of what we're, we're trying to deliver. And it's not just get billions of people to use BARD. Of course, we want to make it as helpful as possible. It's continue to promote the ecosystem that we've been working so closely with for so many years. That's a good point. Instead of my language of this possible shift from video back to text to some degree, it's more so this added layer on top of the already existing media ecosystem. It's very interesting. Um, but I want to get back to this conversation of consumers and creators in relation to the barred YouTube integration. Like I said earlier, there are so many pros that come to mind when it comes to the consumer. But I was trying to brainstorm all of the ones for creators and one that I immediately brainstormed and I joke around with my friends all the time is I always wish I could delegate the need to keep up with the public sentiment so aka the comment sections because there's a lot of thoughtful and valuable feedback in there not even just feedback just little notes I propose a lot of questions in my videos I love to see people's ideas but as I sift through trying to see those I also come across the things that are just downright cruel, things that are very ill-intended, people pointing out insecurities that I've literally never thought of before. It's like just things I don't need to read, right? So I ran to Bard. I was like, oh, are 
comment section is integrated. I was messing around, doesn't seem to be the case, but yeah, it would be so cool to be like, what's the general sentiment in the comment sections? If there's some brutal feedback, can you give me the feedback in a more empathetic way? You know, things like that. I think those use cases could be so good for creators and are such prominent problems that across the board you hear from people. But having worked with creators yourself, what are other possibilities when you think about the Bard, YouTube, and creator relationship? This is one of so many things that you're flagging and we need to experiment with. We need to continue to try to find how we maximize this helpfulness. And it's part of why, well, A, we've shown every update that we do. We have an updates page on BARD where you can see not just here's what we did, here's why we did it. And we're inviting that feedback. And so just even a conversation like this of getting that, hey, here's something that we'd like to see. Here's something that would be really helpful. Um, is uh, a good step. B, in a broader context, when we think about what's going to come next to BARD, the thing that we're trying to do is balance between both what's the feedback that we're getting, and also there are developments in the technology that are somewhat unexpected that you then try to figure out how to make it most helpful. So like when we started BARD eight months ago, we weren't really focused on a language model doing math, like language and math seem relatively incompatible from the beginning, but we knew that these language models were good at writing code. And so a couple of weeks into it, talk about you know people sometimes not being the kindest, that's fine. Uh, but you know people started putting in like one plus one and Bard was responding with three and they were, uh, not most politely saying, ha ha ha, silly language model doesn't know what one plus one is. And of course, like over the course of training language, like how many things have you seen? Like one plus one equals three because it's the sum, you know, the sum is greater than parts, whatever. But then we have these like enterprising members of our team that are like, well, what if you just ask, write, ask Bard to write the code to solve that problem and then execute the problem and then give you the answer? And then like, bam, all of a sudden Bard can do math. And like we figure that out in two to three weeks time. And so we're balancing it between these things of like, people are using it, they're giving us their feedback. But then there are these things like, hey, have we tried using this technology in a new and novel way? And so we're just constantly building between those things. And as we find those, as we get the feedback and as we find these di different discoveries, we post them transparently on the updates page. And sometimes we get a lot of positive feedback. Sometimes it's a little bit more muted and it's part of the learning process. There's like so many possible pathways. It's, I don't know, too much to think about for me. On X, Twitter, whatever you want to call it, I've brought up some similar thoughts as I'm bringing up today. And two replies really caught my eye. They're very similar, but they weren't in conversation with one another. One person said, how do you think this will change what creators make? And the other person said, in this case, we should then see a trend back to sub 10 minute videos. Videos with condensed high quality information in least time should be most highly rewarded. There's this ongoing conversation about a YouTube meta, which basically refers to the general energy cultivated on the platform or the general way content is going. I don't really like the term because I think it demeans the wide range of content on YouTube. Personally, I'm not watching videos with like 10 million plus views really. Most of the videos I watch are definitely sub 1 million views, even like, yeah, sub 50K, sub 10K. So I don't see the YouTube meta a lot in my personal consumption. But I also can't argue that someone like Mr. Beast hasn't had rippling effects on the platform. And people often refer to him as the YouTube meta of recent years. So when you think about Bard, conversational AI, LLMs playing a more prominent role in our lives in the years to come, do you think the YouTube meta is going to mold to that? And if so, what type of content, what type of media do you see emerging at the forefront? So as somebody that's worked with uh, creators and uh, in the music world for a long time. One thing I was always fascinated by was how art adapts to the medium it's in. And so when the first short play records came out on vinyl, they had a maximum length of roughly three minutes and 30 seconds. And at the time, most popular music that was stemming from 
you know, a, a lot of explorations in in jazz were eight, nine, ten minute songs. And the modern pop song that's three and a half minutes long, that's still the rough average of a pop song, goes back to you used to be able to distribute music in new ways on these tiny short play records. And the and the medium adapted. And then a couple of years ago, you start getting into the world of playlists and Spotify. And you know, you had like the XXX Tentacion uh tracks that were like a minute and 45 seconds and people started to realize like oh wait i get more listen counts whenever i make shorter music and so people like you had this massive flurry of people making songs that basically had two verses instead of three because they were able to they were able to uh get more uh get more streams at the time thankfully uh <laughs> we've reverted back to having three verses because I think that makes a better song. But this is kind of like a natural evolution of how creativity matches to the media. Like how how long did we have horizontal video? And then all of a sudden vertical video starts to come in and you start to see things like YouTube shorts and reels and, and TikTok, of course. It doesn't mean that horizontal form video, like the one that we're recording right now that's going to be on YouTube, like it doesn't change the the format. It just means that you adapt and however you might adapt this for some of those vertical forms is going to be different than what you do for horizontal. So that's a long way of saying, I think art has an amazing ability to adapt to, to transformations. Yeah, I really got to think about that because something is undoubtedly going to come out of this interaction with media. It could be something completely out of left field it could be something that's on the cusp right now and we're seeing hints of and we won't really know until it really happens and then we're more so reflecting on it. I don't know. I can't think in this moment, but you mentioned earlier how your team has a Bard Updates webpage. It's really great. I used it to research for this interview. I prefer it to OpenAI's individual blog posts because it's just this yeah single page where you lay everything out. It's really easily consumable. In terms of incorporating Google's broader ecosystem, these really stood out to me. In May, the ability to export BARD's outputs to Docs and Gmail. Images from Google Search brought into outputs when applicable. In June, the ability to export any tables that BARD generates into Sheets. In July, Google Lens integration into BARD, so the ability for a user to use image in their inputs and not just text. And aside from YouTube, most recently in September and October, BARD being able to integrate even further with Drive and Gmail and being able to summarize and answer questions across your personal content, as well as retrieving information from Google Maps, hotel, and flights. So your team is shipping at a pretty rapid rate. What's the North Star vision to make it feel like Bard really has a grasp on a user's entire Google ecosystem experience? Yeah, there's there's a North Star for Bard overall in the experiment phase that we're in, which is understand how to help people bring their ideas, their curiosity, and their needs in the form of productivity to life. And so that North Star is one that we're going to continue to move toward. Like bringing an idea to life is this amazing capability of the technology. And sometimes that requires some controllability around, hey, I want it to be much more refined and I want to make sure that I can double check anything that it shares with me because I need very accurate information. And so we launched something like double check responses that we did a couple of weeks ago, which you can go through a creative response and see what's content from around the internet that agrees with this and what's content that maybe disagrees with it. And of course, that's not the end state that we want to get to. We want to get to a point where you can consistently uh, control when you want that style of an experience and then sometimes making stuff up is the way to bring an idea to life when you're thinking about a new project that you want to do when you're thinking about uh you know a, a home project that you're trying to like bring to life that maybe you haven't done before like you're trying to create some sort of new creative uh art project with your kid like that controllability i think is going to be uh, an interesting lever and what you'll hopefully see through these updates here is we're going to be trying a lot of things to help you bring your ideas to life they're not always going to work because uh 
the only way that you find it out is to give people the access. But we do it within these parameters of keeping it responsible, make sure that it doesn't do things like uh, drive you toward illegal activity or, or do harmful things. So that's the core parameters with which we're doing it. But we want to be out there and we want to give people a reason to try new things. And I'm just amazed at the sorts of ideas that, that can come to life when you use this thing. You shared this tweet back in October saying, Bar collaborates and does things with you. Assistant delegates and does things for you. So to clarify for viewers, as you know, Google Bard is a product, and then separately, Google Assistant is a product, in case you've never utilized it before. I feel like Google tends to have this issue because the company is so large and so many things are going on at once, where products, features of very similar nature get shipped. There was this one tweet that cracked me up. It was like, Google Duo is being merged into Google Meet, formerly known as Hangouts Meet, which is not to be confused with Google Chat, which is a separate app previously known as Hangouts Chat, which was replaced by Google Talk, Google Plus Messenger, and Google Plus Hangouts. I was like, that 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 sums it up a lot of the times, I feel like. Um, but there's already this collaboration between Bard and Assistant. And when I think of what I want my relationship with an LLM to be like, or maybe like instead, the better way to put it is my singular AI sidekick across my digital experience. When I think about what I want that to be, it does seem to be the combination of those two products offerings. So do you think in the future, I know, future speculation, I'm sorry, that they're going to combine and it be just Bard, it be just Assistant. So one of the names is killed, but again, their use cases integrate. I think in the way that you propose it, it might be too narrow or limiting in terms of what a language model can do. Mm. As, as we look at where we are eight months into having language models in the hands of users, the things that we're seeing pretty consistently are, help me bring this idea to life. And it happens in different places. So to your point, we've been exploring ways that, uh, Bar that Bard can help understand your email through our Gmail extension. And then there's also the help me write in the form of Gmail. As we're going through this exploration process, the part of it is speed of insight. How quickly can you get something and understand it? As we build this under, as we build a deeper understanding of how these interaction models work together, it's starting to emerge how people are thinking of using the technology in a way that is conversational. That they want, uh, they want elements of consistency in some parts. They want dedicated, isolated uh, use in others. And so, again, hard to speculate on exactly what will happen in the future, but uh, it's coming from a point of we just need to keep listening and understanding how people are internalizing this. Because it's not just about getting technology in people's hands. It's listening to how people talk about it. And what, like when I start hearing people say things like, my bard helped me do this, it's this like really interesting trigger to hear like, wait, wait, wait what your bard like that like and starting to pull on um try like trying to understand what uh is meant by that is kind of a, a fun experiment to continue to to run with yeah i like there being a streamlined name for these things to your point everyone has a bard they call it my bard because i think it creates this shared collective experience and keeps it human in a way like we all have a bard because the media landscape, you know, the world is so fragmented in so many ways today. So that kind of collective glue, I think is cool. And when you get into the territory of naming these things, whatever you want, making their voices, whatever you want, making them look like whatever you want, that's when the territory gets a little weird, right? But it's also interesting and I appreciate the insight. I'm sure everyone listening is going to find it all pretty fascinating as well. So Thank you so much for the time, Jack. I appreciate you taking the time, Jules. It was good to see you. All right, everyone. As always, thank you so much for watching. I think something to keep in mind is just how wild it is, how much both the internet and the media landscape have evolved over the past 25 years, and how something like this is just going to further impact that. If you have any ideas how, let me know, because I'm going to be thinking about it. Um, again, thank you all so much for watching, and I'll see you next time.